Um, so today's lecture is actually going to be about this issue of um, what I call systems thinking for projects. It might be called complexity in projects. And um, you may be surprised. You know, why am I why am I talking about this this uh, issue? Um, well, uh, the motivation in many ways is some of the statistics you may have seen about uh, the real challenges associated with success in, in software projects. Um, uh, software, uh, the success of software projects, um, whether they succeed or fail, and, and the quality of which they succeed, is what we call a systems issue. It's, it's an issue that at a technical level is, is complex. Um, and, and to understand why software projects succeed or fail, or the degree to which they succeed or fail, you really under, need to understand some basic principles of, of complexity, um, again, in a technical sense. Um, these are complex systems. And the system side of, of this and of quality has often been ignored. And, um, and it's to the detriment of, of projects. And, and it's led to common problems, um, cases where decisions have been made by managers, uh, to try to uh, improve project output or quality of projects. And they've led to what I'll term blowback, cases where actually the decisions have worsened the situation, or at least not better than the policy resistance. So, you know, uh, managers requiring long hours, um, ignoring the impact on fatigue and finding that you know, people are working long hours of the project's not going any faster. And in fact, it slows down more because of quality problems that come up because people are fatigued. And so you're just running as fast as you can just to stay, stay, um, you know, uh, to avoid falling back. Um, using uh, abuse, some managers have used abuse to sort of scare a team into delivering. And of course, what happens is people leave, people hide information from the manager. And at least projects to end up in a bad way. Um, uh, there are man cases of managers judging progress by, you know, bug fix reports, um, but ignoring the fact that it can lead to weird uh, incentives in terms of of bug reporting and so on. So, in other words, if they penalize people when they find bugs because they say that's a quality problem that shouldn't have existed, people won't they'll hide. The quality problems, right? They won't report them because they don't want to be docked for their pay or whatever. Um, and they don't want their coworkers docked. Um, and there are cases where projects which have sought certification for being, you know, having excellent software development processes, according to what's called the capability maturity model at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And they've therefore avoided taking on challenging projects that are risky and that would have pushed the envelope. And they end up um, you know, not, not take, being able to take on certain opportunities. And really what all of these have to do with is sort of trying to optimize some outcome but ignoring the side effects, ignoring the bigger picture. And what I'm gonna be talking today is, is simultaneously about the bigger picture, but well, I'm going to be showing you a lot of diagrams that are sort of qualitative. What you should know is there's actually a science to what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the structure of systems. And there's people such as myself and others who have actually gone about and formally modeled uh, projects, software projects, uh, other types of, of uh, project management, where you actually capture these things in simulation models. And you can actually reason about like the trade-offs between different ways of managing a project. What's the impact of an agile process? What's the process? What's the impact of longer sprints versus shorter? Uh, how much does it help to put in place a, you know, uh, a big investment in crash reporting or what have you, um, or to have certain types of management structures. Now, um, so we're gonna be talking about some things that are that have a qualitative side, but they have a really quantitative side. The same sorts of models that you know I, I report on for every province in the country for COVID, those things can be used for software as well. Um, it's it's different issues. It's not spread of a virus, not even a computer virus, but it's kind of characterizing the 
the underlying structure of the situation. And there is logic to what's going on. There's structure. And we're going to be building up diagrams. And I expect you folks to learn how to build up the diagrams from this lecture, which kind of capture elements of that structure. And although they'll maybe look a little bit qualitative, you should realize they can be turned into rigorous, science, uh, rigorous models, just as, just as we do in COVID-19. And they can be used with machine learning and other tools to sort of help us better manage complex projects. Um, if we don't do that, there's, there's all sorts of problems that arise. Um, you get projects that go to hell in a handbasket really quickly. When things go bad, they start accumulating things. You get a vicious cycle where it gets worse and worse and worse. And each new problem breeds new problems and it just spirals into a death spark. Um, or you get situations where you get a lock in where you're in a bad situation. It's really hard to break out of it. You're fighting fires all the time and you don't have time to invest to prevent those fires from happening. And so you're always doing playing whack a mole with bugs or with morale problems or with turnover or what have you. And you get issues of policy resistance where you, you try to make a change and it won't, won't actually change it. So issues like this are known as systems issues or complexity uh, within other spheres, in, including infectious diseases, where which was one of the areas where people first recognize this. So we're going to be talking about some principles that come out of the area of systems. And, and this area has a qualitative side. Peter Senge and others, uh, Gerald Weinberg specifically to, uh, to software projects. But it's a very quantitative side that amongst my, among other things, my group is, is involved in. Um, and it's really about thinking more deeply about the structure of these systems and intervening more judiciously. Um, so it turns out at the heart of this in software is this thing called quality. Software quality has this pervasive aspect. It may just seem like one aspect of the situation. Up on this board, three months back, my very first lecture or two in this class, I drew out a triangle. Does anyone remember what that was designed to represent? It was the what triangle. Anyone remember? It was the name of a first material. Yes, uh, for the iron, iron triangle. What were the corners of the of said triangle? Time. That's right. Cost. Cost. Dollars. Yeah, quality or or values people will sometimes put here instead of quality. Well, quality is, is a contributor value, but there's other things too, like the, the scope of the features pretty thin. You know, so you can have more features, a bit of fair quality, or lots of good quality for a smaller set of features, and, and you still get free quite a bit of value. Now, um, and it turns out quality is one of these things which, if you invest in it, uh, if you shirk it, if you don't invest in it, it actually worsens the situation for these other two if you really neglect it. Um, it can mean more time. This is a really important point. Um, we, we think of these as being trade off. Like, I can, I can do it really quick if I don't care what quality is. But if you need to achieve a certain quality and you neglect bug finding or you neglect peer reviews or you neglect testing, chances are to get that level of quality, you're going to have to work a lot longer time. So there's an aspect of quality that's like neglecting um, quality concerns to worsen time and worsen dollars. It also worsens value. Um, and it turns out it's it's linked to a whole bunch of different things, including customer satisfaction. Can you imagine that? Could your stakeholders be affected by your by the quality of your product? So it is. Um, it ain't so. It is. It definitely is the case. Um, the time taken to develop it. There's lots of bugs. Can take longer to work them out, right? Um, 
it can affect morale. Can the quality affect morale? You're dealing with a really, really confusing code base with lots of bugs in it. Yeah, morale can suffer, right? If you're dealing with a great code base, I've had the pleasure of working with some amazing developers over the years. Um, and, you know, working with really well crafted code, well architected, beautifully characterized, clean. It's a job that can enhance morale. Quality affects workload. It affects cost in the end. It affects turnover through morale. And ultimately affects likelihood of project cancellation. But there are these feedbacks. There are these vicious cycles and virtuous cycles we talked about, these path dependent things. And of course, I teach next term, 394 858. It's all about modeling and systems like this. But, um, and uh, I'd love it someday if someone did a software project model. That would be a, a cool, cool thing. Most models tend to be in other, other areas. But um, uh, where we're working towards is to be able to characterize systems in a way that captures their essential structure. And a diagram like this is called a causal loop diagram. Okay. Um, uh, and we'll learn to read it. I know it looks to you like a massive spaghetti right now. But there's something there. There's actually structure being captured there, which if you really think through it, is thoughtfully characterized. It has to do, for example, with the link between managerial pressure and overtime and overtime and fatigue. Over time, they increase the amount of work per day because you're working more hours, but it increases fatigue. And fatigue lowers the amount of work accomplished per day. You're too tired, you're to be slow. And scientific studies have actually shown that, like, you can push people to a degree and they'll actually produce more for maybe a week, maybe a bit more. But then if you push them too hard for too long, they actually produce. Not only less per hour, but less overall. They're working 12 instead of eight hours a day, and they're actually producing more hours per day. This is true when, when people are laying bricks. It's also true in software. It's also true in software. Some of these really cognitively demanding tasks, it may be more true because people don't think any faster under pressure, and they don't think more clearly if they're tired. Um, and that's important for, you know, putting in place bug fixes that don't cause more bugs, for discovering the cause of bugs, testing it thoroughly, doing peer reviews, you need a, a fresh one. Thoroughness of testing affects the number of things. It affects, by finding bugs, it affects the amount of work to be done. But you're finding bugs and you're shifting them from undiscovered bugs. You know, just it's not like it creates bugs. Former president of the United States didn't want to ship to talk with sick people from COVID in, in the opening months of the pandemic, opening weeks of the pandemic. The Grand Princess was the, the name of the ship. He didn't want it to dock in the U.S. because he said it will increase the number of people with COVID in the U.S., um, which is a wild notion because, of course, the ship docking doesn't increase the number of Americans with COVID. It, it just acknowledges their existence. Um, which, uh, and similarly, he didn't want testing to be done because he thought that it was creating people with COVID, which is you know, not an accurate assessment of the situation. Um, it's finding thoroughness of testing is finding bugs that were there otherwise undiscovered. But it does lead to more work to be queued up. But it also makes the product higher quality once those things are fixed. So I'm just picking some you know, fairly arbitrary links from here. But the point is, this thing may look like you know, all over the map, but there's, there's an essential truth to what's going on here. There's a structure just as much as a Pulley has structure to it that you study in physics, or a, you know, a pendulum has a certain structure that leads it to swing a certain way, or a car engine works with, with uh, cylinders firing and, and turning a, an engine shaft, etc. So it is with these systems. There's a kind of mechanics of them 
that if you describe it in a diagram like this, you can start to reason through it and you can start to understand why certain behavior comes, why projects go to hell in a handbasket, and how you can stabilize them. Um, so we're going to be coming back to this diagram, but first I need to teach you some principles of how to build it and how to understand things like this. Because you'll notice that in addition to these links, there are these pluses and minuses. You know, like on, on some of these. Maybe you can't see it. I should have distributed the non-field. But but they're they're on the screen here. And there's also these half, see these half marks, these kind of um, parallel lines. That means a delay. And that's also part of the diagrammatic notation. This is a type of notation that is just as rigorous as let's say the notation we use to describe circuits or Boolean gates and in um in a boolean and in, in logic. Um it turns out a large part of this diagram <coughs> describes the effects of quality. Like you could carve out this, and this is really all about quality. It's about things like bug fixes and finding bugs and the impact of fatigue on that and the quality of the project. This is all about quality. And you'll notice that it actually ends up affecting things outside of it. You can see these links from quality factors to things like morale. Things like resignations. What do you mean? Why are we capturing resignations? Because, well, how do I tell me? Okay, so maybe you grant morale is affected by quality. I said that earlier and Ted's nodded. How might resignations end up affect quality, end up affecting quality? It's affected by quality. Why might it end up affecting quality? Anyone? Anyone? Uh, the reason I'm going to leave. No. Yeah, the people who know the most about the code base maybe walk out the door. They know about the reason certain things were in place, why we did it one way versus another way, how to debug an issue quicker with this, how to use these tools really skillfully to sort of uh, uh, deal with certain performance issues, and they're walking out the door. And guess who gets hired instead? Newbies, right? People who don't know the system, who may not know that much about the tools, maybe fairly new to the language of the library. And could that cause quality problems? Yeah. Lee, did you want to add anything to that? Yes. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. And guess who has to train them? Who trains these people when they come in? The most experienced folks who are therefore not writing code or holding peer reviews, they're, they're training new people. So it takes the time off of the most experienced people away from the code base to upskill up the, the new hires. And you've already lost some of the most valuable people. And the fact that these people are spending their time training instead of dealing with the system and improving and fixing the problems is hardly adding to their their sense of morale so things spiral quality affects morale affects resignations which affects quality and you can start to see a cycle right there already um other things you know training needs and project lateness and client satisfaction and managerial pressure all parts of it but you know it's different it's different than a pendulum or an engine or, you know, how the, the meteorological processes work and in terms of weather or how geological processes work. Because here there are human factors involved in decision making. This issue of managerial pressure, whether they push for overtime or not, whether they punish people for finding quality problems, whether they, you know, judge a project as, as uh, being behind prematurely and put on the screws, that's an elective thing. That, that's something that can be changed by people. But there are some parts of this that are kind of the logical structure of the system. So this is where we're going, and this is why we're going there. But let's look about let's look at some of these uh, diagrams. Okay. Um, so a causal of diagram, which as I just showed, can be shown like this. And these diagrams are used 
in dozens and dozens of places. Uh, my group happens to use them a lot when describing issues uh, related to health or community safety and well-being and so on. Um, but you know, they're used extensively in project management. They're used in business decision making. Uh, they're used in uh, engineering areas, et cetera. And the idea here is that we have factors shown in a, in a that are shown with, with words here, like the number of mistakes and the amount of learning from mistakes. These are quantities that you can have more or less of. They're, they're ordinal quantities. You can have more mistakes or less, fewer mistakes, or more learning from mistakes or fewer. And you notice there's links between them. And a link from A to B, like from mistakes to learning from mistakes, means that if you raise A, if it's labeled with a plus, what it means is if you raise A, B will tend to increase. Compare, and I, I'm going to put two qualifiers on this, but I expect you to know. If there's a link from A to B, the plus it means if you increase A, B will tend to increase compared to the value it otherwise would have had. All other things being equal. So, in other words, we're not changing other things in the system. If we increase the number of mistakes, it'll tend to mean we have opportunities to learn from other things. All other things being equal compared to the value it, it otherwise would have had. It's not necessarily saying learning from mistakes is going up, increasing. It's just, it, it's higher than it would have been otherwise. Maybe it's decreasing because of other factors over time, but because we've had more mistakes, that's a higher value than it would have had otherwise. Okay, and a negative polarity, such as this lower one with the minus mean, as we increase learning from mistakes, it tends to lead to fewer mistakes compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all of the things being equal. So there's that qualifier at the end to take into account these things are put into much larger diagrams like this. Where there may be many other things affecting what's on the other side there. Thing with arrows going to. Um, okay, so if we go back to this diagram, you'll see like morale, the fact that this is linked to resignations with a minus sign. Anyone want to say what that means? If morale is linked to resignations with a minus sign, what would that mean? Yes, Louisa. Uh, if you're not linking the dot sign, you're more likely to quit. Okay. Yeah. So if you increase morale, it's 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 easiest if you think about it in terms of the first one increasing. If you increase morale, it will tend to decrease the chance you'll resign compared to the value it otherwise would have had. All other things being equal, because there may be other things that that um, fatigue, all other things being equal. If fatigue is increased, it'll tend to lower morale compared to the value otherwise would have had all of the things. Okay. Um, by contrast, there's some plus arrows here. Over time, will tend to increase fatigue compared to the value it otherwise would have had all of the things. Hmm. This hash mark, this dash dash, sort of perpendicular here, means it's a delay. So over time, you could do over time for a certain amount, and it won't have that big an impact on the key. But if you do it day after day after day, um, you, you grind down, it will tend to do increase. Uh, you can do short sprints, you can't tend to do more than this. And there's a whole literature studying these effects psychologically. There's a mathematical definition for anyone who who um, uh, appreciates mathematics. I certainly Caught myself in that area that has to do with partial derivatives, like there's this is x and this is y, um, and it's the direction of a partial derivative, but I won't go into that here. Okay. Um, so when you reason about these, it's really helpful to reason about a link in isolation. If it's a link from x to y, ask if x were to increase, would y increase or decrease compared to the value and otherwise would have had all of the things being equal. Okay, um, and um, and that's that's how you uh, think these things through. Okay, a few tips. Variables should be noun phrases generally. Mistakes 
learning from mistakes. Variables should be at least ordinal. It should be a notion of bigger or lesser. Um, uh, you, you should be able to have some sense of, of, of more or less of this quantity. Um, uh, and, uh, and they should have an unambiguous polarity, like uh, a link should have an unambiguous polarity, plus or minus. If, if it's not clear, you typically break it into multiple, multiple pathways and multiple mechanisms, as they're called. Um, um, and you've got to be careful staying away from mega diagrams and so on. Um, okay, so so like here's an example of a, of a length that's ambiguous in terms of its polarity. Over time and work accomplished per day. Someone someone could recently critique and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, is this a plus or minus? If I increase over time, does it increase work accomplished per day or less? Well, you could, you could make two arguments of it, right? But look, over time surely means they're working more, more hours. And therefore, the work accomplished per day, look, it's, it's going to be at least somewhat more often. Um, but it's going to, it could also have other effects that might decrease it because quality is lower. People get tired or lower morale or what have you. So in these cases, what you do, it's a link between overtime and work accomplished per day. You often break it into multiple pathways. One pathway, which might be uh, more immediate, is you spend more time now working and therefore you have more work accomplished for that. You know, you're working 12 hours instead of eight and you use those extra 50% time to, to get more done. But it does lead to other effects. Some might be more immediate, like you start, look, I mean, you gotta do some things during your day, right? You, you need to do some, take some personal calls. You need to write some personal emails. Um, you need to incorporate some, some activities to allow you to relax. And therefore, maybe you incorporate other tasks into your working day that, you know, make you um, keep your spirits up, but make you feel less quick, right? And so that will tend to lower efficiency um, uh, during the, how much you get done per hour um, in, in the short term. But it also may lead to fatigue. Um, and fatigue with some delay, and that will lower efficiency. And these, these things contribute to lower work accomplished per day. The fact that you've got to attend to a lot of daily activities may lead to, uh, and weave them into the work, may lead to less work accomplished per day than would have been the case otherwise. So, so what I'm saying is when there's a diagram with ambiguous length here, you can break it into pieces. And breaking it into pieces will allow you to reason more unambiguous. Um, I had actually made the mistake of saying great incorporation of outside tasks here that are more out of building. Those would impact the peak as well. But um, here, what I actually meant was things that, you know, are just like paying bills or whatever, um, that they don't maybe increase um, your morale, but they're, they have to be done. Um, okay, so it turns out when we have systems like this, often what we see is loops loops like this. These are called feedback loops, okay? Um, you may have heard the term feedback before. Uh, anyone want to say where have they heard the term feedback in, in, um, in the past? Anyone? Yeah, the fault feedback ratio. Bugs, so you try to fix one bug and it goes, creates another, right? And it comes back and it's feedback. That's a feedback. It's a kind of a loop in that. Where else do you hear feedback? Anyone? How about in the, uh, yeah, I've Feedback. They amplify, right? The mic picks up the sound coming out of the speakers, amplifies it, and it gets played by the speakers, and it gets louder and louder and louder, right? And there's this squeal that develops, or loud booming, or it develops. We've all heard it before. That's again a case where there's a loop puzzle. A leads to B, leads back to A, and it cycles. Um, and feedback indicates this situation where change in one area kicks off a rippling set of changes that 
come back around and either reinforce the original one or balance it up. There could be there could be balanced things like the defects as well, like the defects that cancel each other out. And prior to this lecture, I was searching around for something that would allow me to demonstrate the safety of that powerful foundation of health and safety issues. But um, you know, if I were a bit more creative, I could probably balance one of these chairs with my finger or something like that. But uh, um, if you've ever balanced a broom on the end of your end of your hand, you know, you realize that because you follow it as it's moving, you can actually keep it upright. That's that's a favorable case of feedback. You're anticipating where it will fall. You're responding and you're keeping it elevated, right? You've probably played that sort of game before. Um, and and that's, that's a form of feedback as well. Um, you're kind of balancing out its actions to keep it upright, to, to, to sort of cancel them out so it won't fall. And it turns out loops exist of these two torts, reinforcing and, um, and, can, and uh, canceling or balancing. And, you know, people, when they look at systems, they, they often learn to think this way. Now, these are actually from Bill Gates uh, back in the 90s. Of, um, you know, the more users the internet gets, the more contents it gets, the more users it gets, right? Um, biggest advantage we have is good developers like to work with good developers. Good developers breed good developers, right? Um, uh, and, you know, if you have enough users, you get feedback from users that help you improve your product, and you can have an even better product. Um, these are all feedbacks that, that he's citing in the red herring now. Um, a, uh, a sort of uh, newspaper or, or a, a circular for the tech industry in the US, uh, tech investment. Um, and these tend to lead to virtuous cycles and vicious cycles. Um, some of these are virtuous, like in the entrepreneurship space. Um, you actually like these cycles many times, right? You have you have a good product, you have customers, the more customers you have, the more you have word of mouth from customers talking about your product or service, the more they spread the news, the more they make you go viral, the more customers you get. The virtu a virtuous cycle. So companies grow really quickly, right? 10 users to 20 users to 40 users to 80 users, 160, 320, 1024, one, one, et cetera. I should be 12, eight. Um, um, okay, so, um, you know, this, sort, this is what we call positive feedback. This is with a plus in there, the positive feedback group. And we can look at it by, we can identify its polarity by looking at the product of the signs here. Okay? So the signs are along each of these components. And in a loop, those, those loops form uh, uh, a complete cycle. So um, here we have, for example, a positive, a positive, and a positive, and those lead to those lead to a plus for the entire loop. So the rule of signs is you multiply those, those polarities. Plus times plus is a plus. Minus times plus is a one. You have a negative number times a positive number, you get a negative number. A negative number times a negative number gives you a what? Positive number. And so it is with this. Okay. So here you have positive, positive, so it's a positive. Here you have negative, negative, and positive. The two negatives cancel. Negative times negative is a positive times a positive, and you get a positive, right? Um, these are examples of positive feedback loops. And these sort of loops, it's just like Jurgen's example of the audio. It gets louder and louder and louder. Oh, continue. Um, but it gets louder and louder and louder. It amplifies itself. It reinforces itself. Um, it gets larger and larger, like a snowball rolling down a hill. It accretes more and more and more. Um, and you can think of these in the infectious disease area, right? With spread of an infectious disease in a new population. One sick person becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, 16. It just multiplies. 
it's in the nature of these systems that they tend to grow really quickly. Maybe it's a bacterial population and it's breeding really quickly. Whatever it is, these systems tend to grow very quickly. Um, it can be good sometimes with customers. It can be bad sometimes with you know COVID-19 spreading in an environment where there's no control measures in place because people ignore the model. Um, okay, um, that was that. Uh, so, so sometimes managers are part of this cycle. So for example, if you have unmanaged risks, you have more schedule disruption and more schedule disruption, it can lead a project to neglect its risk management. And guess what that leads to? Let's go through that again. If you have unmanaged risks, if there's mis risks that are not managed properly, it can lead to schedule being disrupted because risks come about, right? And your plans get thrown off. You are counting on having this thing in place and it's not available. And that leads the schedule to be disrupted. Right? Um, and with the schedule being disrupted, if a manager is not very savvy, they will go into firefighting mode and neglect risk management on other things. And neglecting risk management on other things will mean more unmanaged risks. And it will cycle. You'll notice I phrased it here, reflecting the fact these are negative. But we can think about each like more unmanaged risks need to lead to more schedule disruption. The more unmanaged risks you have, the more schedule disruption you'll tend to have compared to what it would have been otherwise, although this is meaningful. The more schedule disruptions you'll have, the less time managers may take for risk management. That's a minus, right? They're playing whack a mole, they're fighting fires, and they say to heck, you know, we don't have time for nice cities of risk management. We're, we've got it's all hands on deck fighting these fires, dealing with this quality issue the customer found. Um, everyone's got to be working towards that. No time for reviews, no time for risk management. If they take that action, that would mean schedule disruptions will tend to lower the time for risk assessment and management. And if you do risk assessment and management, it tends to lower the amount of unmanaged risks, and therefore doing less of this will lead to doing having more unmanaged risks. So this is a positive feedback. Not positive in a, in a sense of good, but positive in the sense of reinforcing. In a sense, it gets worse and worse and worse. And in fact, the term for it in audio is positive feedback. The term for it in electrical engineering is positive feedback. This is a case of positive feedback, reinforcing feedback. It breeds on itself. And there's many cases of this in, in project management. Here's another one, right? You have emergency interruptions. Customer calls and are really unhappy about a problem. What, you have time under time pressure to fix it. Quality assurance gets skipped. You say, look, we don't have time to run the full suite of tests. You've got to get this bug fixed out to the customer. Um, and we got to get, we got to push it to the website to deal with this issue because our customers are killing us right now because our website won't even allow them to see last year taxes. So you push out this fix without quality charts, without peer review. And guess what? That means you have more faults shipped and you get more system trouble incidents reported. You have more emergency operation. This is the risk of you know, undercutting your own quality assurance processes. Or maybe you have overload, you have fatigue, more outcomes, you have low productivity, and it leads more to overload. These things are elective. There's an element of managerial decision making we'll come back to in all of these. It's not fated. Here's with here's with turnover, right? Um you have uh maybe uh, 14 productivity, so you have a backlog of work, you have developer fatigue, it works in morale, tends to lead to resignations. You have hiring related work that's required um, in terms of training people, as Lee was saying, and that tends to lead to lower team productivity because they're spending time, the most valuable people are spending time training people. And it also leads to resignations, lead that work that that person who left was going to do, leading from someone else's desk. 
and it's maybe an area of the system they don't know well, leads to more work for a team member, which lowers team productivity even more, and which therefore worsens the backlog of work, et cetera. This is a case of morale tied up in this kind of entangled with quality problems, breeding uh, and, and team productivity problems, breeding more and more problems over time. Okay. Um, so going on about this. Um, so I think we'll uh, we'll skip forward to some um, well, I'll, I'll just say positive feedbacks are associated with unstable situations. Situations where it spirals out in a certain direction gets worse, more and more pronounced, worse and worse. Whether it's cases of COVID, whether it's number of bacteria in a wound, whether it's aspects of uh, bugs in a system, uh, whether it's aspects of turnover over time, it gets worse and worse and worse. It doubles every seven days or what have you. In fact, in COVID, we talk about the doubling rate a lot. Um, the doubling rate for Delta is a lot shorter. The time it takes for Delta to double in a new population is a lot shorter than with Alpha P117 or wild type of COVID-19. But there's another type of loop. And it's called the balancing loop. And this is something which is part of our very basic psychology and biology, right? We're fatigued, and so we sleep, and that makes us less fatigued. We make mistakes, hopefully, we learn from mistakes, and hopefully, we make fewer of those mistakes in the future, right? Um, and these types of things are self regulated We get hungry, we eat, we're less hungry. We get thirsty, we drink some water, and we're less thirsty. These are matters that are balancing in nature. They, they balance themselves out, and they seek a balance. They seek a situation where they're in stasis, where it's in an equilibrium. That's why we can live in very cold weather here in Saskatchewan, right? Well, even when it's minus 40, our bodies adjust, we wear the right clothing, and our metabolism speeds up, and we're able to, to operate okay at minus 30. Our bodies are filled with these so-called homeostatic processes that balance each other out. But it's not just in terms of physiology. It's not just in terms of our ability to respond to the environment unconsciously. We make decisions which are balancing. Like in learning from mistakes. Like in if we're too fatigued, we take time off. If we're too stressed, we take time to make sure that we can work to reduce uh, our stress levels. We could bring ourselves back in balance. Extremely important. We might go see a movie, right? Um, and that's a good thing, that's a needed thing. One of the things with short sighted managers lose track because they think you're taking time away from the project, you're going to do less work. No, it's a key thing to keep the project in balance. It would be madness to undercut things which build our morale, which lets us uh, better manage our stress because it will lead the system to spiral out of control. Um, but managers often lose this. Um, so, you know, within Within projects, just as in our biology, we need regulatory mechanisms. So when we're in overload, and it leads to fatigue, and it leads to morale problems. We should be investing in time to take for morale building activities, things that are that enhance that morale, so we don't get resignations. Because resignations breed quality problems too, and that puts us even further behind. Right? We should be dealing with things that lower the fatigue, help the morale by, by reducing our activities, whether it's going and exercising or doing yoga or meditation or sports or taking time off for a movie. You should be investing in these things because they bring your project back under control. They keep it in balance 
rather than leaving it to spiral out of control like this. This may sound fuzzy, but it's not. It's actually a really, really important insight that comes out mathematically from systems like this. And just as in public health, we need systems that will bend the curve and keep the number of cases down by regulating, uh, by regulating activities, putting on masks, et cetera, um, social distancing, engaging in, uh, making sure that people don't go into high risk venues like gyms uh, without, without being vaccinated. That's what brings the system under control. And so instead of growing like gangbusters that we brought under control, instead of flooding our hospitals, we brought under control. And this is the perverse incentive. So the perverse incentives here, if you look only right in front of you, you're like the mouse that looks two inches in front of your nose, you're going to, you're going to be cutting the activities out because you feel they're taking time away from the important things. And that ends up putting your system back in this regime where people start leaving. Morale goes to hell. More, um, you know, fatigue kicks in, team members resign, quality problems build up, unhappiness on the part of the customer builds up. And you know, you're always in firefighting mode. You never have time for risk management, peer review, proper testing. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. And the good developers leave for projects which want them because they have lots of opportunities and you're stuck with people who are often more junior, don't really uh, have the ability to contribute uh, readily because of a lack of knowledge, really poor morale. And how are you gonna hire new people with really poor morale? It gives it a bad reputation as well. So all those things uh, you know, go, uh, go down the drain. Uh, when when a system's in bad shape, so we can work up from diagrams like this, whether it's negative feedbacks um, to uh, to positive feedbacks um, to into larger structures, and uh, what you'll find is that these are not arbitrary diagrams. I did a I did some consulting at one point. Uh, for a large software company, a sizable software company associated with a very, very large uh, associated uh, domain specific company, where I used these diagrams to argue what was wrong, what needed to be done, et cetera. And, you know, once you draw a project, what you find is whether it's this project or that project, it's a project in Google, a project at Facebook, a project in Twitter, a project in Microsoft, a project in Fantastic, a project in Bexima. Any number of different places, uh, SED, Talian, uh, Mentor, what have you, you'll basically find the same structure. It's the same basic set of issues that come up. There can be elaborations of it. The role of customers may be a bit different, whether it's a service or a product makes it a little bit different. But by and large, you get these same issues with quality and testing and morale and resignations and issues with fatigue and issues with pressure and lateness and satisfaction uh, on the kind of quality. You get the same structures you have with the with this iron triangle coming out in these systems. And there are dynamics that are generated of exactly this sort these sort of positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks. And you can totally model it, actually. And you can reason about, you know, if you change it this way or that way, if you put in place an agile process, or you have stakeholders embedded in the process, or you have shorter cycles for development, shorter sprints, or if you add, you know, extra, extra efforts and bug finding, you put in place crash reporting or whatever, you come like those impact things. Um, it turns out that, one of the more pernicious things that happen is you can get these lock-in effects. And lock-in effects are a situation where, you know, you get in a situation it's very hard to escape from. Um, there's a lot of situations like this in life. Addictions is one of them. Heading off addictions early is comparatively easy. Once an addiction develops, stopping it, escaping from it is much harder. We talk about the cycle of poverty, and that's actually another thing. But People are often the poorest, have the least resources to try to escape from. To get a good job is really hard because the transportation is hard. 
or they can't find childcare for their kid and therefore can't keep the hours needed for a really good job. Um, there's many cases where we get locked into situations because of the nature of, of, the, of, of what's happened thus far, and it's hard to escape from it. Um, and it turns out there's some mathematics behind these uh, that can allow you to identify things like tipping points that can allow you to get out of it. Um, and there's a lot of areas of social quality where these issues come up. Getting in a situation where you're constantly firefighting, neglecting testing, neglecting peer review, neglecting risk management, neglecting morale building activities, neglecting fatigue reducing activities can get you into this locked in state where you're undergoing constant turnover. You need to burden developers, I you, burden developers with documentation tasks because you don't know if they're going to be there the next week. So you load documentation on them. You can imagine what that does to morale, right? Um, they got to spend their time writing this documentation, which is going to get updated soon. And they'd rather be somewhere else where they can go light on the documentation. And you have issues with fatigue and morale and and you know the most valuable developers not being able to get work done because they're constantly involved in training or dealing with firefighting issues. It all goes to hell in a headlock. Software quality is one of these things that if it goes south, you'll you'll you can end up in this locked in state. And with that often goes more out. Sometimes trust and respect also get lost there and you can get teams at loggerheads. And you can get these systems which are really unpleasant places to work in and which have extremely low productivity, low morale, high burden. And then other teams, and I've worked on some of these teams, it's amazing. They're called gel teams. They are teams where there's a lot of trust, there's a lot of respect built up within the team, there's low burdens because people's morale is so high, they wouldn't think about leaving. They, they, they can work in a lightweight way produce code that has high quality associated with it and that really invests in the quality processes you need to keep it high such as good testing peer review good inspections um and uh good use of assertion specification really putting a, a, a premium on good quality and they can hire excellent people because a team like that breeds excellent people it breeds hires that want to work there they hear how good it is and a team like that is a joint for And those are two totally different possibilities for software. One locked into an adverse mode, one in a very, very favorable self-perpetuating cycle. And one of the biggest differences that makes the difference between these is having a good manager. Good manager that will support it. Allow the team to take the time off that it judges it needs trust the team to put out estimates that are trusted even if the manager doesn't like them they respect that estimate they may say i wish it were two months less but it's your call it's your folks uh you know best managers who have that right touch and i have worked with them before are are often a key enabler of success in this area but it also depends on on the team um so it's really you know um a key issue and i could go on about this i wish i had time to why murphy strikes when we're most desperate for example um we, we cut the corners and we we put ourselves at disadvantage um and why we need to be careful about relying on heroes but i think that's all we have time for today um it's a big issue uh if you want to learn more about these systems uh i do teach in 394 a related material um, this is just the application of project management of this, where we get into quantitative model building in that course, which, which is applied to project management software elsewhere. Okay, so next time, uh, we're going to be going over first part of entrepreneurship. Okay, that's on Tuesday. And remember, no presentation for those who didn't hear it earlier, no presentation next week for you folks. We're doing the presentation on December 7th, class time, even though there's no 
no class. Formally that day, it's after the end of class, so be here for the presentation. Okay? And I look forward to seeing that after you hand in the uh, final delivery. Okay, we're coming to the end of the talk, and I will look forward to, uh, to reviewing your ID thoughts. Thank you.